So today is、um, May 31st. So I think it's the sixth night of protests and riots and the, the catastrophe that we're all living through. And it occurs to me that, so it's been about 50 years since we passed the Civil Rights Act. And it seems to me that we have really not made much progress, if any. I mean, other than being equal on paper in the law, but societally, socially, psychologically, emotionally, I don't see that we've made really much progress. Certainly not sufficient progress because had we, we would not be reliving this catastrophe yet again. So we seem to be on this cycle of, you know, every so many years, an, yet another catastrophe. And, and this has been a cycle for hundreds of years, right? In America, and I'm, I'm going to keep this to America for now, even though it's a global catastrophe, really. So, this is something that I've, I've been thinking about for a really long time. And by thinking, I mean reading, following podcasts. I haven't had much of an opportunity to have conversations with. With people on this subject, because, well, for a variety of reasons, there, it's, it's very difficult conversation to have and to be honest, which is what's needed, I think. So, really, what I have is questions more than anything else. I don't really have a statement to make because this is so far outside of my area of expertise that I feel. Really uncomfortable even addressing it at all. But, well, here's a couple things, just thoughts, right? These are just thoughts. And I, to be honest, I've been thinking about it more intensely over the last, I don't know, handful of months, maybe six months, for reasons, a variety of reasons I'm not going to go into, but. So here's. Let me start with questions. Okay? And these aren't questions that I'm, that I'm suggesting need to be answered to me, they're just questions societally. So most of my life I rented places where I lived, houses, apartments, whatever. And I've, and I've owned, I own, right? And there's a, very, there's a very big difference between, in terms of the way you feel about a place that you rent and a place that you own. When you own your house or your flat or whatever, you know, you, you put a lot of effort into. Making that, that place of yours kind of a, a sanctuary, right? Something that you feel is your home. You make it feel that way. But even more than that, it creates a concern in you about your neighbors, right? About the, the, the surrounding environment that you, you live in. So you're not only concerned with your own house, let's say, you're concerned about your neighbors in general. And then the wider community, and then the city, and then the county, and then the state, and then the country. But it's, it's localized, right? Because you can't live a quality life in a place where your neighbors are all miserable, right? Or impoverished, however you want to, to define miserable. You, you can't. You really can't. Particularly when you live amongst 
people. Now, I know some people live in mansions and with gates, but even that, at the end of the day, you, you can't isolate yourself from the world and your community. You just cannot. It's not possible. So when you own a place, you, you, you just have that feeling. It's just, a, it's a very, it's a very, um, it's not a subtle feeling. When you rent, you know, it's, it, it, it feels transitory. Like, mm, take it or leave it, whatever, I'm not going to put a lot of effort, I'm not really that concerned with my neighbors because I'm not going to live here permanently. There's no permanence to it. And it's just a feeling you get, it's not a, a conscious feeling, it's just a feeling. So my first question is, for black Americans especially, obviously, do you feel like you share ownership of this country? Or do you feel more like renters? I have no idea what that answer is. But I'm guessing maybe it's rent renters. And that's a catastrophe. That's a catastrophe, if that's, if that's what the feeling is there. And so that's kind of question one. Let me give you another, another question. Let me set it up. So I've lived in another country extensively. I lived in Russia. And even though I've married into the culture and Svetlana and I have a child, so he's kind of of both, I will never feel that I have any agency in that country, in Russia. So I've lived there, I've worked there, we, I have relative, you know, in-laws there, I have deep connections with people there, my wife being the biggest one. But I will never feel like I could, for example, challenge the power structures of that c country, even in the most basic sense, you know? And I don't know why, I, it's just a feeling. It's not my place to do that. And Svetlana feels the same way living here. She's lived here a long time, she's a citizen, she has all the rights that, that, that we all have, but somehow you just don't quite feel like it's a place that you have a, a great deal of agency in. So for those of you who have lived in other countries, I'm sure you've, you've, you've felt this feeling. It, it's again, not a subtle feeling. It's, it's a very, it's a very acute feeling when you go somewhere else. I mean, even if, I mean, aside from the different language, aside from all that, you can learn the language, you can understand the culture. I understand Russia very well and Russians, but I still feel like I don't have any agency there. Let's just leave it at that. But, I, but what I do have in my mind is always this. If for some reason my existence in that country becomes intolerable to me, I can always go home where things make sense to me. Home, America. So my second question to the world, to black America, Do you feel like I feel in Russia or do you feel like I feel here? Now here's where things get really tricky. Because at least in Russia, I can always come home. I, I have that, that, that release from anxiety kind of always in my back pocket and I can always go home where things make sense. But if black Americans feel that anxiety that I feel in Russia, but they feel it here, well, that's a catastrophe without, without, that is a, mm, That is a civilization collapsing fact, catastrophe. If you don't feel like you have a place that you can inhabit that feels like home, 
where things make sense, and things I mean the institutions that are charged with keeping us relatively safe, etc., where you can make a living, where you can send your kids to school, that kind of thing, and you don't have to live with this high level of anxiety. This is a, 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 a tragedy beyond words. And I suspect maybe that's how some black Americans feel. Now, I, I will be clear about, I'm, when I say black Americans, I'm, I'm not saying that you are all a monolith, just one people. No, it's, it's a collection of individuals like any other individual. I'm an individual, you're an individual. So I'm not saying all black Americans feel the same way or agree, or, but that's just not the case, that's ridiculous. But surely there is a common feeling culturally that maybe most many share. And, and that's the question. And again, you don't have to answer it to me. It's, it's just a question I'm putting out. It's difficult. I mean, personally, I cannot intuitively relate to what that would feel like to not have a home in that sense. The closest I can get to it is the fact that I've lived in another country. And so these are the, these are the questions I have anyway. So let's move forward a little bit from there. There must be a way forward so that we don't have to keep reliving this cycle of catastrophe over and over again. Now, and I say that not because I have answers, I don't. I, I'm not the one for this, but I say that there must be a way forward because we must find a way forward or civilization is at risk of collapsing. It, it, it is that serious of a problem. And I'm not trying to like freak everybody out. I'm not saying tomorrow, but I'm saying this continues to happen. And it, let's just, in America, I think the, there's something like 40 million African Americans or you know something like that. This is a huge portion of the population and it's untenable to just dismiss this, to go, oh, you know, push them over on the other side of the tra train tracks or whatever like has been done. That's not tenable going forward, can't do that. We must deal with this. And the one, we have tools right now that we did not have in, 19, in the 60s, let's say, or the 50s, or any time before that, or any time since, until now. We have the tools, I think, to make progress forward. But the work, the sheer amount of energy and work that will be required to even take a step to find a thread that we can pull on in terms of making progress is extraordinary. It's extraordinary the amount of work that would be, that is involved, but we must do it. We must do it. And it's worth the work and worth the effort. So here's, I mean, uh, again, I have ideas, and maybe they're naive, maybe they're off base, because again, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm just giving you my thoughts and take, you know, grain of salt, right? Maybe, maybe, we can look at, there's one example in modern history, 1996, I think it was, in South Africa, when uh, at the, end of apartheid where they opened the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and they were I think public many of them and, and, and filmed. I'm not steeped in that history and in, in, in the exact details but I have a basic historical understanding of it. 
perhaps that is something that we can model ourselves on. Uh, obviously, there are some very distinct differences. One, that was a foreign power that subjugated the African people there. And this is what makes the American story and, and situation and catastrophe so unique because at least for hundreds of years, we are the same people. All of the people suffering right now, for the most part, were born here, like Iowa. We're all here, we're all American. And yet, there's division. To, to put a nice, you know, to put a not strong enough word on it, there's, there's, I don't have the words, I don't know. You know, I don't know how to describe this well, but maybe something like setting up some, but it can't just be truth. I don't think truth gets you to reconciliation. I think there's a third piece that has to be there, and I think it would be truth, justice, and maybe, so truth will get us to some form of justice, and those two things could hopefully get us to reconciliation. And I don't know what I'm talking about, but in my mind I'm thinking this might be a 50 year to 100 year project. And then after that it has to be maintained. So it's one thing to, let's say, come to some kind of reconciliation, and then the task of maintaining it is kind of forever. Because this history is so, um, it's just in the marrow of America and also the rest of parts of the rest of the world, but it, it's, it's, it's in our marrow. We, we can't not deal with this. This is forever for us, right? I mean, maybe at some point in the future, anyway. So here's my last point, and then I'm gonna shut up because I, I probably shouldn't have said anything in the first place. So when I have, as I have studied this, um, as I said, I've, I've been, you know, I mean, I, the resources that are available, I have made use of books and podcasts and, and especially debates from, you know, the 60s and before that and since then. James Baldwin is one, is one of my favorite authors and he did a lot of debating. And from what I can tell, in my mind, I think there's an opening here that has not been ex explored enough. Now maybe it has, so fact check me on this, but here's what I've seen, and I'm just gonna use white and black for the sake of conversation. So you have a white intellectual, public intellectual, and you have a black public intellectual, and they discuss or debate, and this has been going on for a really long time, decades, many, many decades. And each time there's a pattern that I have noticed, maybe you have too, and I think there might be an opportunity here. But again, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not an expert in this, but I'll give you my thought. And, you know. So the black intellectual, well, let's start with the white. The white intellectual tends to do this. They come at this conversation with statistics and data, right? Job data. Uh, crime statistics, blah, 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 blah. The black intellectual comes at the conversation also with data and facts, but they also weave in the emotional content, that piece, the feelings that black Americans have and have had and have had and have had. And these grievances that have been passed on hundreds of years, there's a reason they existed, let's just call it 300 years ago, for, okay, let's, let's, right? And they still exist today. There's a reason these concerns, these grievances, these anxieties have not eased up over the years. 
So just, just logically, if I just look at it rationally, go, okay, well, common sense says that if, their grie if these grievances were addressed correctly, properly, hundreds of years ago, or even a hundred years ago, or even 50 years ago, or even 10 years ago, you would expect to see the anxieties and the grievances lessen in intensity. Well, here we are, 2020, and they are in full view of all of us. They have not reduced at all. In fact, they've grown, it, it seems to me. Now, I was not around in the 60s when that happened, so is it better or worse now? I don't really know, but I know it doesn't seem much better. So there's a reason these grievances exist still. They must be real because they still exist. The people who originally had these grievances are not around anymore. I mean, a couple, some generations are not here anymore. So they still exist, they exist for a reason, okay. So when I see these debates, what I see is the black intellectual brings data and facts and, and everything and weaves it in this in the emotions and the feelings and the anxieties dating all the way back the white intellectual tends I mean I I've, I've not seen this ever go well where the white intellectual comes at this to try and address the feelings that are at the base of everything else in, t in fact, they tend to dismiss it, right? Now, normally it's men debating, and not all men, but men tend to be more dismissive of feelings or less able to deal with them. And the feelings are, in, are intense. I mean, incredibly intense. What would you expect them to, to not be that way? They're intense in a way that probably few people have ever had to deal with. You know, even in your personal life, it's personal things. You know the per... But sitting across from someone you you maybe don't know personally and trying to discuss this, this deeply personal shared history that one person really understands in, you know, deeply emotionally and the other person doesn't understand it the same way. And you're trying to create understanding. And I think this is maybe why these conversations or debates, they get hijacked by statistics and facts, and I think what we have not dealt with are the feelings. Data and statistics and facts may be useful as a second step, you know, when you want to address, okay, functionally, practically, what changes do we need to make institutionally in terms of laws and so forth. There's where, this, there's where data uh, is helpful, useful. But we're not even at that step, hardly. I mean, laws have been passed. Yes, yes, good. This is needed, for sure. But in terms of just relating to each other, understanding one another, we have to, I think, begin at the feelings. We have to address the feelings that people have, both sides, all sides. But really, we need to focus on the feelings of black Americans and address those things. Do I know how to address them? No, I do not. Do I know how to construct a circumstance in which these conversations can happen at that level? No, I do not. This is not my expertise. But I'm trying to think my way through this and try to make sense of some of this. And, you know, I think we all have a shared anxiety, all of us, and it tends to be around the well-being of our children. That's really where it begins, right? And then ourselves and our extended family and our friends and our community. And what I think has happened, and again, you should correct me if I'm wrong here or off base, I think we have never addressed the feelings of black Americans. In fact, I think we've been quite dismissive of them. I think that's all I've got. Um, I will say one thing. Um, 
I did a podcast. Um, like I said, I, I will share this podcast that I did a couple weeks ago prior to this also, but I'm going to share this one first. So I don't know. I think I'll leave the comments open for this one and see how it goes. But if it starts to get... I'm not going to probably respond to any of it because this is all that I think I, I said, probably said too much already, but um, I felt like I probably needed to address this because, it's, it, because of what it is. 